Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> Acts 2, and we're going to read verses 41 through 47. Acts 2, verses 41 through 47. And we'll read them responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on 41, then I'll read 42, and we'll alternate until we end on verse number 47 of Acts chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, please, all of us standing to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 41. Ready? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the scripture here this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for the wonderful music today. It's uh, been wonderful to sing praises to you. And Lord, I pray that our song service today has come up as a sweet savor to you this morning, and our praise would continually be of you. Now, Lord, we pray your blessing on the special as it's sung and as you prepare our hearts to receive the truth from your word this morning. May you put our heart in tune with your heart, and I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Love 
on a hillside so long, long ago. For you and for me, Jesus died, and love's greatest story was told. I love you, I love you, that's what Calvary said. I love you, I love you, I love you. same hands that suffered and bled. Giving all he had to give, a message so easily Father in heaven, we bow before you now in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word this morning. Thank you again, Lord, for the wonderful spirit that's in this place this morning. Thank you for the great singing of your people. Now, Lord, we pray that you would help us now as we open up your word. And Lord, I pray that you would keep us from distractions. Keep us, Lord, from things that would take our focus and our attention away from what you would want to say to us this morning. Lord, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We don't believe it's the words of man or the words of men. We believe it to be the words of God. And I pray that you'd use it to minister to our hearts today. And so help each of us to focus and help each of us to listen carefully to what you would say to your church this morning. May you use the message and the truth in each of our hearts and lives this morning. And I'll thank you in advance for what you'll do. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you this morning about this importance or the importance of church membership. You know, there's uh, a great, I don't know about a great movement, but there's a movement in Christianity that folks don't really understand why do I have to be a member of a church? Everybody ever heard that statement? And uh, several of you have. And for us to understand that, we go to the book of Acts. You understand, our reference point for church is not what we've always done or the way it's always been, our tradition, our, uh, what, our, our reference point is the Word of God. Uh, and certainly we go back to the book of Acts and the church <clears throat> that was established in Jerusalem and with the apostles there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. What we read this morning was a result of the day of what's called Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost that was observed. 
120 people, after Jesus had ascended back to heaven, 120 of his followers, including 11 disciples, gathered in the upper room. And they were tarrying there until they were endued with power from on high. That's what Jesus instructed them to do. They were waiting for the power, the endowment of power of the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think that's when they were indwelt with the Spirit of God. I believe there's a difference between being indwelt by the Spirit of God and being empowered by the Spirit of God. And I believe they were empowered that day by the Spirit, by the Spirit of God. And God gave them a unique ability that day to speak the gospel in the languages of people that were gathered at Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. I believe there were 17 or 19 different nations there that day. And, and they stood up, the apostles went out to preach the gospel, and everyone heard the gospel in their own language. They were surprised, obviously. They were stunned. These are, these are uh, uh, unlearned and ignorant men. And uh, how could they know these languages? Well, God gave them that ability. This wasn't some unknown gibberish. This was a language that people understood. And so they heard the gospel, and what you heard here was, what we read this morning, 3,000 people believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior and they followed Him in baptism. Now I want you to notice that the Bible says that the Lord added unto them, in verse 41, He added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now, if we say He added unto them, we have 120, they go out and preach the gospel and 3,000 believe and now that says the Lord adds these 3,000 unto them, who are the them? Who are the them He added the 3,000 to? The 120 that originally were in the upper room. In other words, the church started out that day with 120 and it ended that day with 3,120. Okay? That's a pretty good day. And uh, then in, in church growth, amen? And, and so they added, and uh, there's, there's Two things that took place after these folks received Christ as their Savior. First of all, they were baptized. All right? And they were baptized immediately. You say they didn't didn't have to go through a six week class or a 12 week class and uh, understand what baptism was all about. They knew that baptism is an act of obedience to Christ. We get baptized to be obedient to Him. When the Lord gave what we call the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the very next thing he said to do was baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The third thing was to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And so we're, we're to go, and once you get saved, the very next thing you should do is you should get baptized. It is not part of salvation, but it always in the Bible immediately followed salvation. You're picturing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you get in the baptistry, you're letting everybody in the congregation know, I believe Jesus died, He was buried, and He rose again for me. And you're identifying yourself with Christ. You're letting Jesus know, I'm not ashamed to be identified with you. I'm not ashamed of what you've done for me. And it's an act of obedience. Jesus Christ was baptized because it fulfilled all righteousness. So He's our example. And we follow His example. And if you're here today and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized since you believed, then you need to be baptized. That's the next step of obedience that you need to take for the Lord. All the way through the Bible, you see that from here these believers in Acts chapter 2 to later on the eunuch in Acts chapter 8 to Cornelius and his relatives in Acts chapter 10 to the jailer in Acts chapter 16. In every single case, they were saved and then baptized immediately. In the jailer's case, it was in the wee hours of the morning. Uh, But they just got him and followed the Lord in baptism. So it is not salvation. It does accompany your salvation. It should come when you get saved, you follow the Lord in baptism. If if you don't get baptized, you still go to heaven. You go dry clean, but you're going to heaven. uh, But you go and you'll be disobedient to God because you didn't obey Him in baptism. The thief on the cross didn't get baptized. Obviously, he was dying on the cross. Okay, If you meet that requirement, we'll let you pass on baptism. All right, But other than that, you should obey the Lord and be baptized. But the second thing that accompanied their decision when they received Christ as their Savior, besides being baptized, was church membership. The Lord added unto them. The 120 gathered in the upper room. Dr. R.G. Lee was a famous preacher 
Some of you are familiar with Dr. Adrian Rogers, who uh, went to heaven a few years ago, pastored Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Prior to him pastoring that church, R.G. Lee pastored that church for 40 years. And R.G. Lee was asked, can I be a Christian without joining the church? And R.G. Lee said, well, yes, it's, it's as possible as being a student who will not go to school, a soldier who will not join an army, a citizen who will not pay his taxes or vote, a salesman with no customers, an explorer with no base camp, a seaman on a ship without a crew, a businessman on a deserted island, an author with no readers, a tuba player without an orchestra, a parent without a family, a football player without a team, a politician who is a recluse, a scientist who does not share his findings, and a bee without a hive. I get the idea he kind of felt like you ought to be a member of a church. What do you think? And, and receive Christ, be baptized, and be involved in a old-fashioned, Bible-believing, Christ-honoring Baptist church. I believe that's what every Christian ought to do. And that's, I think that's just normal Bible Christianity. That's what they did in every case in the Bible. Charles Spurgeon, well over a hundred years ago, wrote this regarding membership in a local congregation. He said, I know there are some who say, well, I've given myself to the Lord, but I don't intend to give myself to any church. I say, why not? And they answer, because I can be just as good a Christian without it. And I say, are you quite clear about that? You can be as good as Christian by disobedience to your Lord's command as you can by being obedient. There's a brick. What is the brick made for? It's made to build a house. It's really of no use for the brick to tell you that it's just as good a brick while it's kicking about on the ground by itself as it would be as part of a house. Actually, it's a good-for-nothing brick. So you, Rolling Stone Christians, I don't believe you're answering the purpose for which Christ saved you. You're living contrary to the life which Christ would have you live, and you are much to blame for the injury that you do. That was Charles Spurgeon. Boy, you'd love him preaching in our church, wouldn't you? And uh, those old preachers, I, I love those guys, man. They don't mince any words, amen? And tell, tell it like it is. And so... You, they, they both believe, Spurgeon and R.G. Lee and others in the Bible makes it clear that you, you, you not, once you're saved and you're baptized, you unite with a local body of believers, a church, and, and not to do so is being disobedient and you're failing to fulfill the purpose for which God saves you. Now there's several things that God gives us, some pictures He gives us here in the New Testament about a church. First, the, the whole concept of the New Testament church shows us or points to membership. I tell you that the word church itself is found 82 times in the New Testament. And in and, and nearly every single case, it refers to a local congregation of believers. Don't, now there's, somebody says, well, I belong to the universal church or the invisible church. Well, the reason people like that invisible church is because they can have invisible attendance and they can give invisible tithes and they don't have to have any accountability. There, there is all believers, all believers are referred to as the body of Christ. And that's okay. And that's true. All believers are not yet the church. Because the definite of a church is a called out assembly of believers. What God has right now on this earth are local assemblies of churches. Our, our brother Evangelist and his family and his sister, they're from Salem Baptist Church. They're in that, they're members of that local body of believers. And there's a church there in Salem. There's a church here in Grove City. And there's churches like that all over this country in different cities and different areas and different neighborhoods and their local churches, local gathering, called out assembly of believers. All the believers aren't called out yet. Oh, there's coming a day when we're going to be called out. We just sang about it this morning. Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. What? The trump shall resound. We're going to rise. We'll rise to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we be with the Lord. Then we're all going to be a called out assembly 
in heaven. That's why the Bible says we'll be called the church of the firstborn when we get to heaven. Because we're a called out assembly of believers. Then we'll be the church. But until then, we are in local churches. We're in local bodies of Christ as we assemble here together to worship, to witness, to fellowship, and to serve. And, and again, in every case through the New Testament, you find that it is just expected that an individual believer would attach themselves to a local church. The other thing we see in the New Testament is the fact there's an existence of church government in the Bible. And it indicates that they had some clear form of church membership. For instance, the Bible gives some qualifications in 1 Timothy to pastors and to deacons and their qualifications and who they're to shepherd and who they're to watch over and who they're to oversee, if you will. And, and, and to, Paul said he labored diligently among them. He says that we're to over, the shepherd is to oversee them. And the shepherd in Hebrews 13, 17 is to watch for their souls. How can you do any of those responsibilities if you don't even know who your members are? You don't even know who you're supposed to be responsible for. I can't, I can't give an account for the people I'm supposed to shepherd if I don't even know who they are. I have to know who they are in order to give an account. In fact, on the flip side of that coin, the Bible says in Hebrews 13 and verse 17, that you, the Christian, is to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. The idea is that you're to submit yourself to the spiritual authority of a pastor and a local church. You're to be underneath that umbrella of protection that God provides for you. And, and to be uh, put yourself under that. Yes, and I don't, I don't have any authority over visitors. I do have authority, spiritual authority, over members of Bible Baptist Church. If you're going to serve in a ministry, I'm going to tell you what the qualifications are for serving in that ministry. There are, there are ways you, there, there's an attire you're going to have to wear, there's standards you're going to have to meet, there's faithfulness requirements, there's things that you have to do. I've, I, I do that because you're a member of our church and you place yourself under the authority of the pastor. And that's biblical. That's the right, the, the right thing to do. The third thing is, I see the example of early church, the examples of the early church that teaches me that they had members. I believe, as I said earlier, I believe being saved and getting baptized and having nothing to do with the local church is foreign to the Bible. You don't find anybody like that in the Bible. That when individuals repented and they believed in Christ as their Savior, they were baptized and they were added to the church. You see that throughout the book of Acts. Acts 2 and 41 and 47, again in Acts chapter 5, again in Acts chapter 16. I did find out historically there's evidence as what could be considered church roles as far back as the 3rd century. There's papyrus fragments found at different church sites that, that list names of people underneath the name of the church. I guess it could have been the early church role. I don't know doesn't say church role on it, but there's a church name and there's a list of names underneath it. And so I think the, <clears throat> the example of the New Testament and historical things that have been found point to the fact there's church membership. Now I think that it's not just a matter of believing, it's not just a matter of belonging. I believe, it's, I believe belonging is a choice you make, that you're going to belong to a New Testament church. You're making a choice to be in fellowship with other believers. You're making a choice to be a part of a family and a local fellowship of believers. I believe the church is God's plan and design. I believe it's His most cherished creation. It's not my church. It's not your church. It is His church. Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't believe any accomplishment or organization, our country, our civilization is as important as the local church. 
The church is vital. Now, when we say membership, it's taken on a little bit of a different meaning today. To a lot of people, to become a member of something is you sign up to join this or that, and maybe it's being part of a club, or maybe you have to wear a silly hat or something if you're a member of the moose or the whatever. Uh, I, I, I think when I, when I think about that, I think about the old Jackie Gleason thing, whatever the, the lodge they were a part of, and they, they wore those silly hats. But membership is making a conscious decision, a conscious choice. You're going to be part of a fellowship. You're going to be part of a family, a church family. That you're making the decision to be part of that local church. You're going to be an active participant in the local fellowship. You become part of a church family. Now when you join and become part of a church family, you're going to learn some things. What you do when you became part of your family. Now you were just born there. You didn't have a lot of choice in the matter of who your family was. But I'll guarantee you, growing up, you learned some things in your family. And you learn, you definitely learn some things when you join a church family. And, and I just, I could list a whole bunch of them, but I'm just going to use three of them this morning. And I want you to understand what you're learning. When you learn, number one, you learn perseverance. Perseverance. John chapter 10. Would you look there with me, please? John chapter 10. The Gospel of John. If you're still in Acts, just go back one book to your left. And you have John 10. Jesus said in verse 10, The thief cometh not, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and have known of mine. Here Jesus is talking about a shepherd and a flock of sheep. And he's saying when you have a hireling, someone who's not the shepherd, someone's just hired to do a job, if he sees the wolf coming, what's he do? He runs away. Why? Not my sheep. <laughs> not my sheep. I'm going to get out of here. You may have been in, I'm told, in, there's some family-run companies. When family-run companies get in some trouble financially, Employees bail. Employees run. Family members stick it out. They got to stay. It's their family. I was reading about the uh, invasion of Kuwait by Iraq that started the first Gulf War. At the beginning of that invasion, the military saw the Iraqi tanks approaching, and instead of fighting, they ran away. They got in their jeeps and headed for the border of Saudi Arabia. You say, why didn't they fight? Because they weren't Kuwaitis. They were hired in to fight. And once they saw the tanks coming, and they saw that this is, these are real bullets, I'm out of here. And they took off. Paid to serve, but they didn't think they were paid to die. And so the employee will often bail out when things get tough because he's not as committed to the business as what he receives from the business. What the employee oftentimes is committed to is the paycheck, not the company. The business falters, that's no problem. I'll quit and go get a job somewhere else. But if you're in the family that owns the business, you know that if the business goes down, 
you go down. You've got to stay with it. And you've got to work hard. That's why when, when family members are in the business and they're working the business, they know that oftentimes they're going to keep working long after the others have gone home. They're going to have to stay at it when other people have already clocked out. They're going to have to, because they have a stake in the business. It's a different mindset. Do you understand? And it's a different mindset when the church is your family and you're not just attending. It's a different mindset. Something goes on, hey, I'll go find somewhere else to go. But you can't do that when it's your family. See? You don't, you don't have a problem in your family with a brother or sister, a, a, a son or a daughter, and you say, hey, I'm going to get rid of this family and go find me another one. Though some of you probably have crossed that mind. You've, that's crossed your mind a few times. It doesn't work that way, does it? You have to keep hang in there even when things get tough. Bible Baptist Church has been here for 63 years. 1955. 63 years. Some of the folks, Cindy Taylor since when, Cindy? 85? 33 years. There have been some tough times in 33 years. Been some tough times in 33 years looking at the Wallaces. Looking at, looking at, not with the Wallaces. <laughs> They've only been married 28. No, I mean... They've been members of the... Bob's been here since when? Same in, 85. So the trouble started in 85. Is that what No. no. <laughs> 33 years. Now we find out who the troublemakers were, didn't we? Right? Carol Treadway's been in this church a long time. What, did, what have they learned? They learned perseverance. They learned you've got to stick with it. You got to stick with it. There's tough times and there's good times, and and there's there's valleys and there's mountains, but you you you. If you reap, listen. If you want to reap, when the, some of these folks who were here, when we came 12 years ago and 15 people were here, and voted us in to be the pastor. Okay, it was it was a it was a low time, but you know to enjoy what we get to enjoy now and to enjoy the blessings that God has given us now, you ask any of them if they're glad they persevered through the tough times. It sure was worth it. And that's the way it is. That's the way it is in church. By the way, that's the way it is in your marriage. That's the way it is in your life. You persevere. You stay with it. And you, 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 you commit yourself to that. And you'll reap the benefits. There's, that's the... That's the difference. The difference is someone who's just an attender, someone who's not part of the family, someone who's not have that commitment. You know what they do? They'll just take off and go somewhere else. And those who are family members realize you can't bail on your family. You can't leave your family. And so you learn perseverance. The second thing you learn is service. Employees do what's expected of them. What do you do when you're an employee at a company? You show up when you're supposed to. Clock in when you're supposed to punch in. Do your job. But when the whistle blows, I'm gone. See you later. Family members understand that running a business is not punching a clock. There's no hours. Jesus said in John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. A servant says, well, I have a class to teach and I'll decide what to teach and how to teach it. But a family member recognizes I'm investing into the lives of these people. And I need to teach them what our family considers to be important. I have to teach them the truths that the family says is important. A servant or just an employee or just an attender may greet people and think, well, I'm just an usher at the door greeting folks. 
Are you a family member greeting other members of the family when they come? You see the difference? Servants or employees don't often take the initiative. They simply want to do what they're told. A missionary was relating the fact that on the mission field, they, they had a, uh, where they lived and where they had their church was fenced area. They kind of called it the compound. They had to have that to keep everything safe. But he said, he was writing and he said, I noticed that after our gatherings on Sunday and after our gatherings on church, he said there were times I noticed how messy everything was. Trash on the ground and such. Garbage all over the place. So what I noticed was where, where they were, the country he served in, he said they, they have people who pick up after them. He said, for instance, when we go out to the mall, you know, you don't pick your tray up and go throw it away. Someone comes and picks it up and does that for you. And so at church, they treat it the same way. You take out a piece of candy, a piece of gum, piece, right, and they just throw the wrapper on the ground. Like some of you do. And then stick it under the chair. And he's relating the fact that one day he was walking with a visiting pastor through their compound to go into the church building. And he said he, he saw some trash on the ground. He reached over to pick it up and he picked it up and one of the members said, Pastor, you shouldn't do that. You, you shouldn't be picking up the trash. And he said, I have to pick up the trash. This is my home. This is where I live. When visitors come into our compound, when they come into our home, I don't want them to see trash on the ground. Hmm. And he said from that day on, he started seeing the other people in the church pick up their trash and keep the yard clean and keep the church clean. How about, how about you? When you see something on the floor, do you pick it up? Or do you think, oh, we got church cleaners do that. That's not my job. See something out of place, do you put it back into place? Do you see something and sometimes say, well, that shouldn't be there. Somebody ought to, somebody ought to move that. Do you go the extra mile so the next person that comes in, the next person that walks in will have a better place? Will see a clean place? Do you, do you serve? Do you learn to serve the Lord? That's what the church is for. We're here. Yes, we're here to learn some perseverance, but we're here to serve God. We said before, every, every person, that's why you belong to a local church, is it's a place of service for the Lord. It's where you serve. Every, every ministry that we have here is a way for you to be involved in serving God. Show me the, the works that people do that aren't involved in a local church. Show me the, the children they reach for Christ. Show me the, 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 the prison ministry that they, they run. Show me the, the addicted that they reach. Show us the hospitals that they visit. Show us the doors they knock on, the gospel tracts they give out. The, mission, the missionaries they support to take the gospel through the world. God does that through His church. And that gives us opportunities to serve our Lord. Which is what you want to do as a believer. So you have to look, do I... Do I see my church as a place I attend or do I see it as my home? Let me give you the third thing about church. Perseverance and service and the third thing is humility. You know what you learn when you become part of a church family? You learn humility. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Would you look there with me please? Hebrews 12. Notice with me, 
Verse number 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye, end, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with, what church? Sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? God, the chasten means you correct by punishment. It means to inflict pain for the purpose of reclaiming the offender. That's what chastening means. Scourging. That's what Jesus went through. Scourging, remember? To punish with severity. To afflict with sins for sins or faults with the purpose of correction. That's scourging. And God said He does that to every single one of us. You know how oftentimes He'll do that? He'll do that in church through the preaching of God's Word. And He'll... He'll discipline us. Employees don't necessarily like discipline. Most human beings don't like discipline. We don't like correction. Most human beings, when they're corrected, they begin to point at somebody else. Well, it was their fault. Or if they hadn't done this, or if he hadn't said that, or if she hadn't, and we start wanting to push the blame somewhere else. Much like, Eve did and Adam did in the garden. One of the things you teach your children as they grow and as they're, they're young, you have to teach them to take correction. Children, the, you know why? The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. What they want to do? They want to do it their way. When your child, you know, why, you know why parents call it the terrible twos? Because they never corrected them when they were one. And six months and nine months. And now they're being strong and they're going to test my way or your way. And parent has to learn to say, you know what? You're not running the house. We are. This isn't about you. This is about us. And they have to learn to take correction. And by the way, the correction and the punishment is to help them do the right thing. And that's why God chastens us and punishes us. You see, the Christian life, Christianity is all about changing. We are all to being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. God saves us, and now He wants us to become like Jesus Christ. Now that's going to take some work. At least it is in my life. And so God has to go to work on me. And that means He's got to correct some things. He's got to change some things in my life and in your life. And sometimes we don't like that too well. Sometimes, that means sometimes you're going to come to church and the preaching is going to make you uncomfortable. And I mean, sometimes your first reaction, sometimes what the preacher says, is you're going to be mad, you're going to be angry. Nobody telling me. Nobody telling me how to live. Well, that's just what he thinks. Be careful. Say, God, what do you want me to learn from this? If the if you're uncomfortable, if you're getting a little upset. Don't immediately get mad at the preacher. Ask God, Am I being true to the Word of God? Hey, hey, it, it, is what the pastor just said, is that the Bible? If he's telling me the Word of God, if he's telling me the Bible, then God changed me. Right. Old Sam Jones the Evangelist said, boy, don't you know your preaching rubs the fur on the cat the wrong way? And you know what old Sam Jones said? Turn the cat around. Amen. Turn the cat around, it'll rub the right way. Amen. And you'll start purring. You'll, you'll think it's great. You correct your behavior. You ask God to bring the changes about your life. And guess what? All of a sudden you think the preaching's great. Man, this is good. Suppose you're driving your car and your oil light comes on. You get, you get so irritated that that light's on. 
You either, some, some, I've known some to put a piece of tape over it. <laughs> but maybe you get real aggravated with it and you just get a hammer and you smash the thing, smash the light out so it won't. Wouldn't be too smart, would it? That, that light or that gauge, the, the light is there to tell you it's almost too late, really. That, that's why they call those, what do they call those kind of lights? Idiot lights. Sorry about that. But if you wait till the light's on, you're identifying yourself, okay? <laughs> Gauges are better, but it's letting you know that it's a warning that something bad's going to happen if you don't do something. If you don't take care of the problem, get it repaired. If you don't take it out on the car. Well, why is it when the preacher opens up the Word of God and preaches God's Word to you and you get upset or you get mad, he points out, hey, a warning, you're about to do something dangerous or you're about to do something wrong. You get mad and want to smash the messenger. Oh, don't do that. When, you, when the message hits home and you start to feel conviction or some discomfort, then you need to obey God. That's what the altar's for. That's what the invitation's for. Because you're not supposed to leave the same way you came in. You're supposed to leave saying, God spoke to me today. God did something in my life today. There's a reason I was there today. The message was for me. That's why James says, Be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We're to find out what, what, what God says, not just so we can know what He says, but where we can obey what He says. We can do what He says. Don't smash the warning light. Fix the problem. Fix the problem. So you want to be in a church that will challenge you to transformation. That will challenge you to make the changes in your life that God wants to make in your life. Talking to, I think it was a few months ago when Carol was talking to me, Carol Coleman, and you mentioned the fact, she said, you would not believe how different I am now than the way she used to be. Isn't that right, Carol? She's a different person. Now, can I, can I help you? You know, what, you know what the Colemans did when they got saved? And, and they used to live right down the street here when they first got saved. But you know what, you know what they, 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 they took hold of right away? That they ought to be in church. And, and, and from the very beginning, they were here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They just were faithful every time. And, and really, the best that's why I tell people, the, the best follow-up program, the best discipleship program, is you, you be back in church Sunday night, you be back in church Wednesday night, you be back in church Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you'd be amazed what God will do in your life. You'd be amazed the changes that will begin to take place. You cannot have that, get that much Bible preaching and Bible instruction and it not affect your life. You need to be in a church that will confront you with sin and inconsistency. That will exhort you to love God and to live for God. Let will admonish you to be honest and upright. Let will entreat you to be the right kind of husband, or right kind of wife, or right son, or right daughter that you ought to be. Let will confront you with the command to witness to the lost. To tell somebody about Jesus. That will prompt you to live for others, and to do good for others. That will reprove you for being lazy and apathetic. In other words, you need a church and you need the preaching that steps on your toes. Perseverance, service, humility. A place where you grow spiritually, become like Christ. It's a family. You need a church family. When, when the doctor says you have cancer, you need a church family. When there's trouble in your marriage, 
you need a church family. When you've when you struggle with your addiction and you're trying to live right, you need a church family. You need people who love you and care about you and will be there for you. You need a church family. The importance of church membership. I'll close with this. Did you ever hear the story about the man who became president for one day? I doubt anybody here knows, maybe Nikki, the name of the man who was president for one day. President James Polk spent his last day as president on March 3rd, 1849. At midnight, Polk was out of office. His successor, General Zachary Taylor, refused to be sworn in on March 4th, 1849. You know why? March 4th, 1849 was a Sunday. And Zachary Taylor was a staunch churchgoer. He said going to church is a higher priority than becoming President of the United States. He postponed his inauguration till Monday, March 5th. So for one day, U.S. Senator David Atkinson of Missouri was President Pro Tempore of the United States of America. Can you think of anything more important than becoming President of the United States? Zachary Taylor could. Going to church. Wow. How far we've come from those days. Let's make sure we know the importance of being part of a church family. Now, we say when we talked about those who were added to the church, you know, the Bible says he added the church when they received Christ as their Savior and they were baptized. Then they belonged. You believe, you're baptized, and you belong. But you have to believe. You can't join a church just because, hey, these are nice people. I like them. Well, wait till you get to know us. No. But just, <laughs> I really think this is where I want to be. No, 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 no. That's good, and I hope you think we're nice people. But you have to have your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have to know Him as your personal Savior. There has to be a time in your life when you say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a Savior. And God sent a Savior, Jesus Christ. And I will trust Him as my Savior. Forgive my sin. Give me the gift of eternal life. And you receive Him as your Savior. You, you're saved. You follow the Lord in baptism. And you belong. If you're not saved today, that's the first thing you do. Is receive Christ as your Savior. If you're saved and you've never been baptized, you come forward. We have everything ready and everything prepared for you to be baptized. All you have to do is be obedient. If you're saved and you're baptized, you believe this is where God will have you belong, then you ought to belong. You ought to jump in with both feet and say, this will be my family. This is where I want to serve. This is where I want to belong to this family. This is where I want God to use me. Whatever it is that God has spoken to your heart today, and maybe this is a Christian today, you'll realize, hey, this church, this church membership thing's important. God really uses that in my life. And He has. There are many in this room who would testify to that fact. Don't take lightly your responsibility in the family, the church family. May God help us to do so. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we bow before You in prayer. Thank You for this morning and thank You for everyone's kind attention today. Lord, this morning we've looked in Your Word and talked about the value and the importance that belonging to the church that you established. You were so gracious to give us the New Testament church. 
Some in this room, Lord, do not have family members that are saved. They do not have family members that love the Lord. But you have given them a church family that love the Lord. And there is a help to them to live for God. And Lord, we love you this morning. And I'm praying and asking you to minister to the hearts of people today. That each of them this morning would realize the importance and the value of being a member of a local New Testament church. And I pray that you've spoken to their hearts today. I pray that those in this room who have never received you as their Savior would receive you as their Savior today. Those who have not been obedient to you in baptism since they were saved, that they would come and present themselves to be baptized. Some today who are saved and baptized and they know this is where they should belong. And they need to jump in and belong to a New Testament Baptist church. Speak to the hearts of people this morning, Lord. 